am going to try and download a lot of information and uh, that's the reason why I'm going to stick to a text, otherwise I could go over time. So I've actually been asked to do some crystal wall gazing and uh, in doing so, uh, I actually also uh, want to attempt to uh, provide some reflections and give my own reasons why I have recently joined the farming ranks. So without any further ado, can I say that I am a big fan of the business writer Jim Collins, who in his famous, uh, who's famous for a seminal work, Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't. This is a key book in ANSCO, I can tell you. In his latest book, Great by Choice, Uncertainty, Chaos and Luck, Why Some Thrive Despite Them All, he comments with, he commences with a really two short but very powerful sentences. We cannot predict the future, but we can create it. That was the attitude of many of our forebears who came to New Zealand. It just so happens that my great-grandfather, Henry or Harry, James Harrison, was the second of a family of 13 children. He was born in County Wixwood Island, and he arrived here at the age of 23, 140 years ago in 1876. Although initially engaged in wheat farming, sheep raising became his passion. In the first 10 years after his arrival, he went back to Ireland three times. Twice to get his younger brothers to come and join him, and the third to take a bride. According to his historian grandson, Jim Weir, who was actually a senior New Zealand diplomat and was famous for being the New Zealand ambassador <coughs> thrown out from Moscow when there was the Muldoon Such affair, when Harry died in 1920, he owned 28,000 sheep. He set up my grandfather on a large property at the age of 19. But my grandfather was a very different person. He enjoyed the trappings of his inheritance and had no sense of legacy, at least in regard to farming. He did with racehorses here, and he actually won the New Zealand Trotting Cup. All four of his sons were small farmers with three, including my father, assisted into farm ownership as a consequence of being a returned serviceman. Their farms provided comfortable livelihoods to support their many sporting interests. All four had sons, but none went farming. The legacy had definitely ended. My daughter, Michelle, who's shown, um, I need to go back, who's shown on the bottom here, um, and she actually went to the uh, women's uh, program which she speaks very highly of. She was actually born in London. And she and her husband, who's also a city boy, have commerce degrees. Through some unlikely developments and a keen interest shown by my son-in-law and cattle, we have gone farming together. Their two children, my grand, uh, grandsons, now have the opportunity to rejoin the farming tradition. Look, it's almost 55 years to the day that the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan announced to the House of Commons on the 31st of July 1961 the country's intention to join the European Economic Community. Our Prime Minister at the time, Keith Holyoke, summed up the bid by saying this, it raises questions probably the most serious New Zealand has had to face in times of peace, unquote. There was some reprieve in January 1962 when President de Gaulle of France applied a veto and said Britain was still, quote, maritime and insular, unquote. Well, some would say on the continent in the recent Brexit, as a result of the recent Brexit vote, <laughs> that President Gaulle, de Gaulle was right. <laughs> so Britain's entry eventually followed in 1973. The expectation of this happening had a big influence on the, step, on, the, uh, on the steps I decided to take, including going to the University of Canterbury rather than Lincoln. But it did allow me to become a part, albeit small, of the New Zealand market access lobbying effort in the late 1970s. And this is a, a from the Telegraph newspaper and with Margaret Thatcher and everywhere that, that she went, the lamb was sure to go, and by God, we did put up a big campaign. And now, we have the Brexit referendum result and an isolationist presidential campaign underway in the United States with both candidates seemingly turning their backs on the long negotiated 
Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Without ratification by the United States and Japan, TPP will not come into being. Add to this confusion around global food prices. Back in 2007, prior to the global financial crisis, there were dire warnings about the consequences of rising food prices as illustrated by the many headlines I've got shown here. Look, food prices did recover to even higher levels in 2012 before falling again, albeit gradually, as tracked in this graph of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization data. Global financial markets now appear to, appear to be more volatile. I was in Japan in early February this year when the Tokyo Stock Exchange fell 5% in one day and European markets slumped also badly. Under a headline, a route for rationality, the, the London Financial Times quoted one senior banker saying, rational people suspend rationality in fast moving markets. There's no single cause you can point to, it's pick your poison. So how do we make sense of all this and bring it back to farming smart in New Zealand? Well, I'm going to start with ANSCO's origins. The Muldoon government tried to insulate this country from changing markets in the late 1970s and early 1980s through various measures, including supplementary minimum prices. I was one of a number of people who was heavily involved in the thankless task of trying to find homes for the resultant product. In the midst of all of this, I did go to Japan as part of a mission and wrote a strategy report, never expecting to reside there and get the opportunity to implement. <coughs> ANSCO was born at the beginning of 1984, but industry misinformation campaigns followed in Japan and New Zealand. Pressure was exerted through press reports on how we were doing it wrong. And this is just a small sample of clippings in March 1984, including an editorial in the Christchurch Press. What was not understood was that the carcass and the processed products New Zealand was then supply, sending to the market were not going to grow business. We were able to quickly lift market share by using contract boning facilities in Korea and in Japan. Mutton was processed into intermediate product forms, be it pieces and muscles, so that it could be readily used by manufacturers for finished products. We undertook in Japan detailed consumer research, which highlighted huge problems with the smell of lamb, lamb fat. External fat product forms were produced initially in Korea and consumer tested. The French lamb rack with the fowl removed was born. As has subsequently become the highest value chilled lamb product form, not only in Japan, but in New Zealand's export lamb trade around the world. Boneless short form, short loins, and other items were also developed and eventually introduced to the New Zealand lamb trade in other markets. At the time, ANSCO was operating contract boning plants in Korea. The average per capita income was around US $2,500. Last year, I was present in Seoul at the signing of the Korea-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement at the Presidential Blue <coughs> Palace. Korea's per capita income had risen to 33,000 US dollars to almost the same level as New Zealanders. Today, Korea is New Zealand's fifth largest bilateral trade partner. Student-led protests I've witnessed many times during the late 1980s helped end military war and allowed the emergence of a modern open economy. Korea is now one of six Asian countries that are in New Zealand's top 10 trading partners. The others are China, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore and Thailand. Now what a difference to when I left my farming family at the end of 1965 to finish my formal education and pursue my own career. Then the United Kingdom accounted for 51% of total exports and only one Asian country, Japan at number five, was in the country's top 10 export markets. 
Wool then accounted for 28% of New Zealand's exports. And I'm going to have more to say about that later. Recent public debate in New Zealand on trade and the importance of foreign investment has not been assisted by the lack of objective data. With this in mind, I chaired an advisory committee to the Agribusiness and Economics Research Unit at Lincoln University that has resulted in a report, The Land and the Brand. Agri-food make up more than 70% of New Zealand's merchandised exports and has grown share rather than contracted, as was predicted by many leading politicians back in the 1980s. The whole economy is involved in creating this value. The last official figures available recording the growing and harvesting of raw produce on farms, in plantations and in the sea as a proportion of gross domestic product date back to 2011-12. Then they are equated to 6%. But processing and the supply of goods and services such as transport and communications and the induced effects that flow on lift the total contribution of the agri-food sector to $1 in every four spent in the New Zealand economy. <coughs> we negotiate trade agreements because we seek advantage for New Zealand as a trading country. Our domestic market is small, <coughs> our access to local capital is limited, so we need to look externally for growth and development. This was recognised by a well-known New Zealand left commentator, Chris Trotter, who had this to say when it was announced in 2013 that Japan was joining the TPP negotiations. He said, before wealth can be redistributed, it first must be created. So New Zealand's ability to gain the most from international markets has been impeded by high trade barriers and agricultural trade. Of this, I quote a hero of mine, Clayton Yiter, the former US trade representative from 1985 to 88, who was at the center of pressure exerted by the United States on Japan that led to the lifting of quotas on beef imports, along with some other products, and enabled ANSCO to become the first foreign com company to import meat into that market. He said, agricultural trade policy has long been enigmatic, often inexplicable, always exasperating and frequently counter to the long-term interest of a nation's own agriculturalists. OECD data compiled since 1986 on the proportion of support to farmers in member countries by way of tariff protection, non-tariff barriers and direct and indirect subsidies remain very high at 18 percent but are much higher in countries like Japan and Korea at over 50 percent. Yet overall, on average, they have halved over the period due to less European Union funding, but also higher global food prices. <coughs> in 2009, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization published forecasts for global food demand through to 2050. This graph summarizes those forecasts against actual consumption since 1961. New Zealand has enjoyed a dairy boom, that's shown in the pale blue line, as a result of higher demand for dairy products and improved market access. Yet what I want to tell you today is the projected growth in meat demand, shown in the dark blue line at the top, is expected to outpace dairy. Much of the new demand will be supplied by chicken and pork, but will open up unprecedented opportunities for New Zealand meat and I have to say, especially beef. Today's food security reality is that 60% more animal source foods will be needed by 2050 to satisfy growing middle class demand. And a bit more about that middle class demand. At the, end, at the center of demand growth in the immediate years ahead is China. For those who doubt the opportunities improved market access can bring to New Zealand, Surely the rapid growth in exports following the signing of the China-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement in 2008 are there for all to see. The Economist, in uh, uh, its publication about two weeks ago in a survey on China's rising middle class had this to say. Before the late 1990s, China barely had a middle class. In 2000, five million households 
made between $11,500 and $43,000 a year in current dollar terms. Today, it is $225 million. By 2020, the ranks of the Chinese middle class may outnumber Europeans. This stunning development has boosted growth around the world and transform, transformed China. The signing of TPP on the 4th of February this year brings New Zealand closer to a long-term regional integration in the Asia-Pacific region, with 12 of the 21 member economies of APEC on board. TPP delivers new free trade agreements for New Zealand with five countries, the United States, Japan, Canada, Mexico and Peru. Extends our existing FTAs with Malaysia and Vietnam and updates our already highly integrated relationships with the other four countries, Australia, Chile, Singapore and Brunei. Korea, Indonesia and Taiwan have all indicated they wish to join TPP in the next round. How the United States learns to accommodate China, and you're hearing this during the presidential campaign, is the crucial element to achieving a free trade agreement of the Asia Pacific. If that were to occur, a reinvigorated world trade organization should follow. The Agribusiness and Economics Research Unit at Lincoln University has developed a trade and environment model based originally on work undertaken in the United States for the Uruguay round, which was completed in the mid-1990s. It can be used to analyze possible impacts of policy changes on future net trade and producer returns. The Land and the Brand Report, which I recommend to all of you to read, provides details on 10 scenarios that were modeled for the project. And you can read that report online, by the way. For illustrative purposes, this graph presents the net trade values to New Zealand of all barriers to trade in agri-food products were eliminated. In the case of beef and sheep meat, they would increase by over 50%, while those for dairy products could increase in the order of 20 to 100%, depending on the product forms. At the New Zealand Primary Sector Boot Camp at Stanford University last year, it was considered an average price premium of 20% based on market segmentation and targeting of consumers should be our, our objective. Were this goal achieved, the Lincoln model suggests New Zealand producer returns could increase by between 40 and 50%. Look, the total elimination of trade barriers, barriers is a lofty goal, and I know it won't be achieved in my lifetime, but continuing investment by this country in this effort will provide handsome rewards and ensure the agri-food sector will continue to play a dominant role in the New Zealand economy. To date, New Zealand has had limited success in value adding due to the country's small domestic market, ongoing trade barriers, distance from export customers, capital constraints and entrenchment in the commodity business. There are increasing opportunities to implement value-add initiatives for meat-derived products. However, commodity demand in emerging economies can quickly push up food prices, as has happened in the last few years, making the implementation of a serious value-add strategy by any New Zealand-based meat company an article of faith. Important elements for success require developing a credible providence story based on deep integrity systems, which are linked to specific customers, usually through a partnership value chain. For this to grow, true partnerships will be vital between farmers, processors, and other links in the value add chain. Look, the trader transactional relationship that has characterized the New Zealand agriculture, and especially the meat industry today, needs to change. A win-win approach is the way forward. And I can say to you that ANSCO has tried hard over the years to work in this manner. And I want to give you some examples of where we've done it. Our partnership with the Waitrose supermarket chain in the United Kingdom and the Waitrose Producer Club now dates back 20 years. 
Ansco Foods is the exclusive supplier of New Zealand lamb to Waitrose and collaborates with domestic producers in the United Kingdom as it does with the Welsh University. Waitrose account for 5.5% of the grocery market in the United Kingdom but has a much higher share of the lamb sales at 9% through 330 stores. The Natural Beef Supply Partnership with Aleph restaurant chain in Japan has now been operating 14 years. Ansco actually commenced doing lamb business with Aleph way back in 1985. Aleph has 338 restaurants in Japan and a strong commitment to efficiency and environmental sustainability. This one is close to home here in Canterbury and other South Island farmers have actually benefited from a longer term partnership at Five Star, which began 27 years ago. The feedlot at Wakanui is the only large scale feedlot in Australasia that has never used hormone growth promoters and it has never fed genetically modified feedstuffs. Whether it be grass fed or grain fed, and I know this is going to be a subject coming up later, and you'll note Ansco's on the fence, high end customers are increasingly wanting natural beef. That is not only hormone growth promotion and GM fed free, but also antibiotic free. Ansco Japan has been operating for some years our own quality restaurant called the Wakanui Grill Dining in Tokyo as a part of a strategy to lift the profile of New Zealand beef, lamb and other items. The Wakanui Grill Dining has, has related restaurants in Fukuoka in southern Japan and in Singapore. So from those beginnings back in 1984, today we, and as a, as a sheep meat sales and marketing company, today, 32 years later, Ansco has tr transformed itself in the mid-1990s <laughs> to become a New Zealand-based pre predominantly beef operation. And our annual sales turnover in the year end 30 September 2015 was $1.54 billion. But the company's future business direction is to increasingly invest in what we describe as food plus, including food solutions, health care, and feed ingredient, food ingredients. <coughs> New factories or facilities have been constructed to service specific customers. Stainless steel settings mirror more closely the dairy industry rather than the traditional meat industry. Healthcare and food solutions, including blood, animal tissues, protein products, and adding value to traditional low value items that in the past passed to, to rendering is our objective. Now I just want to focus a little on the sheep meat side. I think too little recognition has been given to the transformation of the New Zealand sheep meat trade. Back in 1970-71, practically all mutton and 92% of lamb production was <coughs> exported as frozen carcasses. Today, chill products account for a quarter of shipments and practically all the balanced and frozen bone-in and boneless products. One of the most annoying myths for me is that New Zealand lamb is poorly market positioned. Back in the 1970s, when I was based in the United Kingdom, New Zealand lamb was an economic meat for shoppers. It was sold either frozen in supermarkets or thawed in traditional butcher shops. As an everyday food, it was priced well below beef and at about the same level as pork. Well, today, this graph shows lamb, which is the green line, is now the most expensive major meat in the United Kingdom and is priced higher than beef and well above pork, which is the gray line way down below. Look. I often read about how much more you can get out of the market, but let me just give you now an insight into what really happens. Demand can be turned off quickly if prices increase too quickly. This graph shows what happened in Waitrose stores, and it's something that I don't think you'll get any other meat company in New Zealand prepared to show what one of its customers does. This graph shows what happened in Waitrose stores after New Zealand land prices increased 54% between 2010 and 2012? 
even four years later, we still have not recovered to the 2010 volume. And yet Waitrose is the growing supermarket chain in the United Kingdom. And this is evidence from one of the two premium multiple, multiples in retail multiples in the United Kingdom. So the market is not immune from price. Sadly, I've got to say to you, in all my time I've been associated with the industry, the problem for sheep farmers has been the demise of wool. Back in the mid-1960s when I left home, wool accounted for over half of beef and sheep meat farm revenue. Today, it is just over 10%. Whereas wool accounted for 28% of New Zealand export revenue in 1965, today it's under 2%. Farm revenue reliance is now placed almost entirely on meat. Without a second, better second income stream, sheep farming will continue to struggle. And it's finding that second income stream is absolutely key to the future of the New Zealand sheep industry. <clears throat> An ongoing major influence in the fortunes of New Zealand agriculture clearly is the ongoing volatility of the New Zealand dollar. And God, I listen to this every day. But Tom Scott summed up the hurdles of inflation, interest rates, and exchange rates in this 1988 cartoon. I think all you could say is that the hurdles shown as inflation and interest rates will be much lower, and the problems around the exchange rate have just got higher. So, Based in the mid-1960s with the same opportunities I believe New Zealand agri-food sector now has, I would definitely choose to go to Lincoln University rather than Canterbury. It is this confidence and a desire to encourage skills and others to connect with the world that I have made a personal contribution or commitment to fund various things at Lincoln University. They include a professorial chair on global value chains and trade, and a postdoctoral fellowship on global value chains and trade, which is named after the hero I announced earlier, or commented on earlier, Clayton Yaita, who's kindly given his name to this. I also provide three undergraduate scholarships for urban background students to study agribusiness and marketing, because we need urban people coming back into our sector. So back to farming. To find out whether my son-in-law had any empathy with livestock, he was put to the test of raising these six Frisian bulls. He was there, he was taken right through from the four-day calf, and he passed with flying colours. And we set about, he set about trying to learn as much as he could, largely online, about animal performance and feed management, and he did go to some beef and lamb field days. We, we initially purchased back some of my father's old farm, installed irrigation, and focused on raising bulls. <coughs> then a hill country property with flats came on the market, and we took possession in May last year. Fifteen months later, we're now completion of a major refencing and development program of the flats, with the hills to be tackled from next year. The major income stream will be raising young bulls but we will grow and improve our Angus herd and sheep flock. How good we will be is yet to be seen, but I can assure you there will be much experimentation. Our written objectives were put to our team soon after we became owners of the farm. And some of these reflect the things that we've, I've done in ANSCO over the years, but I thought I'd share them with you. They are within five years, lift animal performance to best practice for each of the distinctive classes of land. Be an innovative operation which encourages constructive ideas from all employees and their dependents to improve the business and family environment. Become an early adopter of proven new technologies. And definitely, this one I'm really strong about, adopt the principle, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, don't bullshit. <coughs> Ensure operations are highly compliant or fully compliant with all relevant and food safety and environmental regulations. 
apply the S5 methodology to operations, is something I learned in Japan. Namely, sort, straighten, shine, standardize, and sustain. And lastly, maintain sound relationships with neighbors, the local community, and local authorities. So that's me coming back to farming. I want to finish and say, I want to finish with a, perhaps the one academic that I really have huge time for in the business world. His name is John Cotter of Harvard University. In his latest book, Accelerate, Building Agility for fast, faster moving, a Faster Moving World, he has this to say. We are crossing into a territory with unpredictable turmoil and exponentially growing change. Change for which we are not prepared. I agree. All businesses in this volatile and fast changing age, and that includes farms, have to learn to be flexible. We need to use well the good times and hold enough in reserve for the lean times that inevitably come. Look, I am confident about the outlook for New Zealand agri-foods and farming. That's why I've joined your ranks and in doing so, hopefully give an opportunity for my grandsons and successive, successive generations to establish the legacy my great-grandfather attempted to pass on after he came to New Zealand. So I'm hoping the genes will be better. Thank you very much. We have got time really only for one question, but hopefully someone will take advantage of that. You certainly cut me back, didn't you? No, that was good. Oh, well, it'll be a long day if there's no questions in any session. Andy. Um, but Graham, the graphs you had comparing sheep and beef, chicken and pork from 2013 to 2016, every Easter there was a real dip in lamb price. It's a frustration for ourselves as lamb producers that happens year after year when our volume is the greatest. Your comment? That's the way the retailers work. They try to encourage ongoing uh, consumption of lamb. Uh, and you're up against big competition, as you know, with other meats. And I think one of the great concerns that you have now when you go to a UK uh, supermarket is the uh, movement towards meal ready and dominated by chicken. So there's more of an effort goes in uh, during Easter to do those very things. A chain like Waitrose is pretty good at it all the time. That's why we have a strong relationship with them. But some of the other multiples, well, it's priceless when it's a customer.